good evening. Thank you, everybody, for having me. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, um, yeah. As the title of my talk um, alludes to, um, I'm interested in uh, ways that we can stimulate the retina in the context of prosthetics, so we can, you know, potentially restore vision. And as for the granularity of, I guess, what stimulation is, et cetera, and so forth, I'll dive into that throughout the course of my talk. So, um, just to do a bit of background. Um, one of the stimulation techniques I'm interested in is called uh, optogenetic stimulation. And what optogenetics is, is it's a technique where you can genetically express a light sensitive protein into a cell. And so in the presence of light, that protein changes conformation and it allows you to manipulate the machinery of the cell. Uh, so if I were to use an example of an optogenetic construct called um, channel rhodopsin, um, what channel rhodopsin is, it's a synthetic uh, sodium channel which opens um, in the presence of light. So um, yeah, in the presence of light, um, uh, the channel opens, sodium um, moves in, and we typically uh, want to express channel rhodopsin on neurons, and um, uh, increase of internal sodium um, uh, activates the neuron, and uh, the net result is that you can actually have, um, you can turn neurons on just with the application of blue light. And this decade's been, um, sorry, this technique has been around for over a decade now, and it's been tremendously useful to allow us to understand different, um, uh, the function of different brain areas, because you know, in essence, you can turn on a brain area, um, ch observe a change in behavior, and you can you know, uh, assign, um, correlate behavior with the brain area. But more recently, people have actually started to use um, optogenetics for um, therapeutic applications. So an example is um, researchers have been able to directly stimulate the um, cochlea to restore hearing. Uh, they've been able to, um, in a non-human primate, stimulate the primary motor cortex um, to elicit arm movement, which has great um, applications for like um, limb prosthetics. And more recently in the clinic, we've, um, they, in a blind patient, they've optogenetically stimulated the retina and they've been able to partially restore vision. And that's where the interests of my PhD lies, where I wanna hone in on optogenetic stimulation and hopefully go beyond just partial restoration of vision. Um, so with that, I'll give you a bit of background on uh, retinal biology. So the way we see is that I, um, light enters our eye, um, and it uh, stimulates a population of cells called photoreceptors. From photoreceptors, we transmit information to bipolar cells, from bipolar cells to retinal ganglion cells, and um, from here, information is transmitted to your brain, and that's how we perceive our um, visual environment. Um, unfortunately, there are some diseases where our photoreceptors de degenerate. Examples are like macular de degeneration or um, retinitis pigmentosa. And what happens is that because we break this circuit, um, whoops, because we break this circuit, um, uh, the result is uh, visual impairment. But what if um, the, um, sorry, I'll go back one. Um, but then, yeah, but um, theoretically, what can happen is in these disease states, if we were to directly stimulate the ganglion cell population, um, which is often spared uh, despite photoreceptor loss, we should be able to potentially restore vision. And that's exactly how retinal prosthetics work. So uh, blind patients wear like these uh, goggles with a camera. The camera works as a surrogate for your photoreceptors. And then a um, implant is placed um, be, um, in the back of the retina. And the camera you know, communicates with this implant via a specialized computer. And it directly electrically stimulates um, the ganglion cell population. And that's how um, vision can be restored. And this is all, um, yeah, this is already clinically available. It's already, you know, it's actually quite remarkable. Um, and, but, you know, to be a downer, um, unfortunately, the, um, in the best clinical case, the highest level of visual acuity that they've been able to restore is 2400. Um, the legal, um, the threshold for legal blindness is 2200. So in, in lay terms, what that means is, um, if you've ever had, had an eye test, that top row is 2200. Um, so, in the best case scenario with retinal prosthetics, we haven't been able to, I guess, restore visual acuity to that level. So, suffice to say, um, there's still a considerable amount of uh, research that needs to be done. And, but one of the reasons um, why um, it's been quite hard to achieve a higher level of visual acuity is um, the method of stimulation itself, like I alluded to before, the electrical stimulation to the ganglion cell layer. Um, one of the disadvantages of electrical stimulation is that electricity has a tendency to spread. 
Um, so um, what happens is that you have off-target activation, and when you have this overly broad stimulation and recruiting too many neurons, that's actually what's contributing to the poor visual acuity. And this is where optogenetics can be very useful, because with optogenetics, uh, we use light to stimulate neurons. Light doesn't spread the way electricity does, and so that already gives us you know, a, a high level of you know, spatial control. And on top of that, there's also some genetic tools where you can um, get certain neurons to express your optogenetic, uh, optogenetic construct. So you have a high level of spatial control from both the level of stimulation as well as the level of the neuron. And because of these, um, of these qualities, we, um, for my PhD, we wanted to, I guess, uh, delve into this further. Is this a viable way to uh, restore vision um, um, you know, in photoreceptor disease, um, can, um, disease models? So uh, to, to do that, uh, we need a model. We have a, uh, have a mouse line where um, channel rhodopsin is expressed in the retina, and it looks a little bit like this. Um, the channel rhodopsin also has a fluorescent reporter, so I can see under the microscope. And then I use this technique called patch clamp, which allows me to um, record directly from a, um, an individual uh, retinal ganglion cell. Um, I can stimulate it with light, and. <clears throat> Um, record the individual response. Um, I can record the response properties. So I've just spent like the you know the past few minutes um, talking up how good optogenetics is, and um, of course there's always like a disadvantage, and that disadvantage is that it's got poor temporal resolution, and that's best evidenced by this uh, plot here. So this little blue part here is just me stimulating a renal ganglion cell. You can see from the onset of stimulus, the response is quite robust, but then this decays. Um, quite drastically over time. So again, we have to go back to the drawing board. We, um, we still wanted a stimulation technique to be um, driven by optogenetics because our issue is in a poor visual acuity. We, we, we need to improve our spatial resolution. But electrical stimulation isn't inherently bad. Um, it's got a great uh, property that it's actually got really good um, uh, temporal qualities, that is, um, you can actually stimulate neurons at, you know, really high frequencies. So, um, you know, to borrow a phrase from Mexican, ch Mexican children, por que no los dos? And um, we incorporated some electrical stimulation, but just used a lot less. And we thought, like, maybe if we use both, we can actually, you know, um, get the best of both worlds. So, um, within some retinal ganglion cells, we used, um, we would either stimulate optically only, electrically only, or combining the two. We will test a range of frequencies uh, from 2 hertz to 200 hertz. Um, I guess, so 200 hertz meaning I like say 200 um, po um, stimulus pulses per second, for example. And this is a t uh, sort of readout that we will get. So when we stimulate at 2 hertz, um, yeah, because we're using a lot less electricity, no surprise that you know, we don't have any activity here, but we can get a neuron to fire. We're trying to use um, the highest safe level of um, optical intensity as possible, so we get a 100% response rate. Um, yep, no surprise, um, when we combine the two, it's still 100% because it's probably driven by the optical stimulation. But as we start going up you know, um, in frequencies, um, the benefits of you know, combining the two is quite pronounced. So again, you know, this is electrical only, optical only, and um, the hybrid, um, yeah, going up faster again. Um, yeah, you can see that, you know, the um, uh, just the raw data is quite convincing in itself. Um, and then, but eventually, you know, you, we go up to 200 hertz and um, the conditions are quite, appear to be quite comparable. And, you know, when I quantified that, you know, across many cells and many recordings, and that's, that, that's actually exactly what we see. We see um, hybrid stimulation improves the uh, temporal resolution um, compared to both electrical and optical at um, our, the, our free test frequencies to 20 and 50 hertz. Um, but we didn't get a st uh, significant increase in uh, at 200 hertz. Um, with that, I would like to uh, conclude and just you know, and hopefully I've been able to convince you that um, hybrid stimulation is yeah, um, it, it, it's a great uh, technique that we can uh, basically harness the best of both worlds. We you know we can increase the our temporal resolution, but we also have you know high spatial control because of its. Um, uh, the foundations of obviously the genetic manipulation. Um, and we didn't just increase the temporal resolution in just um, of optogenetics, but also um, on, we, we improved on electrical stimulation as well. And lastly, 
Uh, I don't want people to think that this is just maybe like a retinal prosthetic bionic eye sort of application um, in the future. Anything that involves sort of a brain computer interface, whether it's um, um, robotic limbs or they're going to say sort of like spinal cord injuries, um, all neurons um, do fire, you know, will fire intrinsically at rates beyond 100 hertz. So it's a part, it's something that just, we just need to work towards. Um, so with that, uh, I just want to thank everyone for supporting me of, uh, during my PhD. Um, I, I hail from two labs. There's too many people to name, but thank you so much. Thank you.